Don't Look Up has become an extremely polarising film. People seem to absolutely hate it or love it to pieces. Or you like me and thought, yeah, it was okay. But one thing I have noticed is a lot of people seem to be in disarray about the editing. Okay, well, maybe not a lot of people, but I've seen enough tweets and comments about it. Adam McKay's films certainly do have a peculiar editing style, but what was it that was so bad? So I had another look and I saw a lot of people were referring to this final scene. If I'm to be completely honest, which at this moment, why not? I actually like the junky taste of store-bought better than homemade. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Yeah, that's kind of a coffee nut. Serious, every time you have coffee, you have to grind your beans? We can get that way or back tea. This is terrible, right? Right? Well, sadly, it's not that simple. It certainly feels wrong, but there's a lot more going on here than you might read on the surface. One tweet in particular that I saw was this from Schaefer Illis. Now, before you come after me in the comments, I'm a huge fan of Schaefer Illis. I'm a subscriber, I watch all of his videos, but he claims that it's clearly a mistake. Respectfully, I wanted to make a case that it wasn't a mistake and it was actually thought out and purposeful. So to try and make sense of it today, we're going to be talking about freeze frames. So you probably understand what freeze frames are. They're very easy to spot due to the fact, you know, the frame freezes. It is not rocket science. But in truth, film is at its core just a bunch of freeze frames, really, or still images played one after another 24 times a second to create the illusion of motion. And in the early days of film, it was important not to break this illusion. The audience and filmmaker entered a contract with each other to see a story in motion. But over time, as audiences and filmmakers grew more aware about the possibilities of film, New techniques were adopted, and holding on a frame for a continued period of time was one of them. It was first used in 1928 by none other than Alfred Hitchcock in his Hollywood classic, Champagne. Here, the effect works as a clever transition to a photograph. Pretty cool, especially for 1928. Fast forward to 2022, and we see this effect everywhere. And its purpose is usually very easy to determine, unlike you know. Store bought better than homemade. So first off we have the freeze frame narration, which Scorsese seems to love. My name is Jordan Belfort. Not him. Me. This can be great for exposition and serves as a much more engaging way to capture the audience's attention and introduce us to a character. This is me. Usually we freeze at a moment of tension or intrigue before going back to the beginning of the story. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. I mean, the technique is actually so ingrained in our modern culture that it's turned into a bit of a meme. Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Then you have the opening credits freeze frame. These are pretty straightforward. Usually they're heavily stylized and serve as a great way to set the tone for what's to come in a more engaging way. Don't Look Up actually features this very method for its own credit sequence earlier in the film. Oh gosh, oh gosh. <laughs> Lastly, we have the final shot freeze frame. In Thelma and Louise's famous ending, we capture a triumphant moment as the two are about to meet their fate. But instead of seeing them crash and peril, we stop on what matters. The moment. The feeling. You also see this in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid as the two outlaws go out all guns blazing. Sadly, with the freeze frame being used so often to end a film, it's become a little bit of a trope and a little bit cheesy. And then we had it! Rocky 3 freeze frame ending! However, this doesn't take away from its artistic potential. In fact, when it was first used in 1959 to end Francois Truffaut's The 400 Blows, it was pretty revolutionary. It wasn't simply a final snapshot after the climax or a team photo when all had been resolved. It was an unexpected, ambiguous halt to the life story of a boy you had become so invested in, leaving the audience to ponder, what next? It was abrupt, but it worked. Professor Julian Cornell said, I can imagine people seeing it at the Cannes Film Festival in 1959 without any advanced warning, going, wait, what happened? The movie's over now? The French New Wave was all about reorienting the relationship between the artist and the audience, offering something that is different from the movies they're familiar with. 
Okay, okay, so what does all this mean for Don't Look Up? Well, we've seen that a lot of the time the technique is nothing more than a neat surface level gimmick, which is fine, but we do sometimes see it used as a tool with much greater artistic potential, conveying a feeling or a moment more effectively than a fate of black wood, for example. But when we look at the weird editing in Don't Look Up, does any of this really apply? It's not a stylized character intro, there's no narration, it doesn't end the film, it still kind of just seems like a mistake, or maybe it's out of place. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that this film is revolutionary like the 400 Blows was. It's not. But we did see that sometimes techniques are purposefully employed to change what we're used to and challenge the audience. We're certainly challenged here because a lot of people do seem confused by the editing choices made. But maybe that's the point. Okay, okay, I know, I know. Hear me out. This end scene is draped with the context of terrifying imminent doom. The entire world is literally about to be vaporised, and as the comet crashes into the world, everything we know is ending. Society, money, institutions, networks, everything. It's almost like the Matrix is breaking before our very eyes. I think we can all agree it's pretty monumental. When speaking to Variety about The Big Short in 2016, editor Hank Corwin said, When I cut, I try to make the experience be experiential, as opposed to being third person watching the character. I want to be inside the character. Experiential, inside the character. Well, what if we were inside this terrifying moment? I know it's just a silly comedy, but how do you capture this monumental feeling of human existence coming to an end and convey it through an intimate family dinner? Well, maybe you do it with these strange editing choices. With all this context, suddenly it becomes kind of clear. Yes, they don't feel right. In any other film or setting, these freeze frames would be terribly placed. But maybe they aren't supposed to feel right. Maybe they should be uneasy. The green screen facade is falling down and a cascade of errors are piling in. And as a result, the edit reflects this. They show us system failure. The Matrix glitching out. Now, maybe I'm being ridiculously kind here, but it kind of gives some of the other weird editing choices in this ending more relevance. Like this strange jump cut where Timothy Chalamet's character comes inside. Whoa. I'm a Fire Puma 142 on Twitch. Do you game? Really doubtful, she knows. Who said I game? Yes, this in any other context is a terrible, terrible cut but surely they couldn't have made a blunder this bad. Okay, I'm definitely being too kind here. But with the context of the editing reflecting the world's implosion, it almost feels like a record skipping. I don't know, to be honest, I can't think of any other reason why they would have done this. The family talk at the dinner table like it were any ordinary dinner, clearly trying to enjoy their last moments as normally as possible. Even as the house begins to shake, they continue their chit chat. Clearly though, you can see their fear. And the freeze frame here offers us a window into the true, quiet comprehension of the ending of it all. Shall Bo Burnham inside? It's also a direct contrast to the jubilation shown earlier in the film, when we use freeze frames on Dr Mindy celebrating the successful rocket launch. Here there's joy in victory, and here there's contemplation in defeat. In addition, this shot of Dr Mindy's son is terrible by any other standard, but with this context it almost feels like another jarring glitch, a quick snapshot into his true feelings. I will agree, this effect would have worked so much better if it reoccurred a few more times. Thematically, it would have been much clearer if we froze on each of the family members around the table, for example. And to be truthful, I did rewatch the film, and there are a few questionable scenes or moments. McKay and Corwin love to abruptly cut to random objects in a scene, which seems to be expositional, but it happens so quickly that it's just jarring. I get why people are put off by this, I, I totally understand it. But in my honest opinion, there is no way these cuts and freeze frames were not deliberate. Yes, they're used in a different way to what we've seen before. They feel incredibly wrong. But when everything is ending, maybe wrong is the correct feeling we should be having. <sighs> you guys are going to crucify me for this, aren't you? Thanks for watching! Don't forget to like and subscribe! We out here! Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please subscribe, comment, like and share. I'm a very small channel, so uh, it all helps. I put a lot of effort into researching for these videos. I try provide some value and some, some good content for you. But uh, yeah, let me know what you thought of the film because I know it's very polarizing. I'm imagining, I mean, if enough people see this, I'm imagining it might be divided because yeah, people really do hate this film. 
And I don't know, I get it, but uh, for me, it was just kind of like, I didn't hate it, I didn't love it. I just thought it was kind of entertaining and good fun. But yeah, let me know what you thought, uh, especially about the editing. Um, or let me know what you thought about this video, because uh, yeah, it'd be nice to know. But yeah, again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon. Bye.